everybody. Um, we are here for a uh, demo workshop from by Maddie Griswold talking about spatial omics overlay, overlay of structurally profiled regions of interest on the geomics DSP tissue images. Um, and so Maddie, if you would like to come on and share your screen. And if you, again, for people on the chat, or uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, we'll take questions at the end unless you want to take them at the end or as they come. Maddie, do you care? Either way it works for me. Okay. All right. All right. Yep. Go ahead. All right. Hello. My name is Maddie Griswold. I'm a bioinformatics scientist at Nanostring Technologies. Um, Nanostring is a spatial biology uh, company. And so a quick overview on spatial um, transcriptomics, if you aren't familiar. Um, at the beginning of RNA sequencing, we typically had bulk RNA-seq, um, which essentially meant that you took your tissue, you put it in a blender, and you sequenced that. So you could really see the homogeneous mixture of the tissue, uh, but not much more past that. Ne the next thing was single-cell RNA-seq, which most of you probably know. But in this case, you could pick out the fruits in the smoothie um, and get the genetic profiles of that. But you still didn't know where that happened in the tissue. And that's where spatial transcriptomics comes into play, where you can actually see the structure of the tissue here um, in this fruit tart, where the actual location of each fruit means something. And that's what we're trying to get to in spatial biology. So Nanostring is um, committed to open source tools. We are attempt we're trying to foster a community of open source method development for nanostring um, data. And we are doing this. We currently have a dedicated internal open source development team that I am uh, a part of. And we have this team so that we can ensure high quality analysis for all tools or for tool, wow, high quality analysis tools for all nanostring users. Um, and we're trying to standardize methods and with the thought that since nanostring scientists are also going to be using these methods, that it will be the best method to use um, by people downstream. So a quick overview of our ecosystem um, today. Our main package is Geomics Tools, and this is the S4 class that we use specifically for um, our DSP data. It's using a expression set um, framework right now. And this will get you from data loading through QC and normalization um, ready for you to do um, any analysis that you want downstream. We currently have over a 1,000 unique downloads, and it grows every day. Our next package is uh, spatial decon. This is a spatial cell typing deconvolution method for uh, spatial data, but it was built using um, the DSP data. This also has over a thousand unique downloads, and we recently had a paper published earlier this year um, in Nature Communications describing the algorithm. But essentially, we take each of the samples and get we can get the cell type proportion um, and population in each of those samples, which is pretty cool. Um, we also have a background modeling technique called Geodiff that is that has a preprint out right now. And the last tool that we have is Geomic Workflows. This is a um, vignette that goes through an end-to-end -end workflow um, on analysis. So from getting your out of the instrument to uh, visualizing differentially expressed genes and um, a lot of other very cool analysis techniques. But even with all of these packages, we still are missing the image. So when you Google spatial biology and look at all of the images, you're very like, the first thing that you notice are all of these beautiful images. Um, or at least that's what I notice when I look at these images. But when you look at the analysis, um, this here is a preprint of a internal paper. Past this one image showing 
um, where the tissue is, where we were getting samples from, the analysis still sort of looks like an RNA-seq um, paper. So other than this one image down here, but the secret behind that image is that it was actually done in Illustrator or PowerPoint. So it takes a lot of effort to first make these little pie charts and then hand place them onto the image. But the community itself can see that there needs to be images in our analysis pipeline. Here in Surat, we're looking at a Visium data set and we have a very beautiful image there. And even yesterday, um, the team showing uh, spatial feature experiments was showing that images are very, um, are present on people's minds. But what happens when our data doesn't look or doesn't, isn't spot based? Um, computationally, it's really easy to create a pattern of spots, but what happens if we don't have that data? At NanoString, our data can take any shape imaginable. Uh, these are five different ways that we can profile tissue. Um, and it's really driven by what the tissue looks like. So geometric profiling essentially means that you can take circle samples, you could take squares, you could circle around um, tissue, like hand draw them, that sort of thing. Segmentation is a very cool um, profiling that you actually take this image and our instrument can take the yellow image and make that its own, or the yellow part of the image and make that its own sample. And then the pink part of the image is a different sample. So we can take that out um, into biological compartments. Um, and then this contour sampling technique is you take this pink section here and you want to go equal amounts away from the um, tissue of interest. So what happens on an inf infiltrate boundary? What happens if you get farther away from that or closer to it? That sort of thing. So with these types of profiles, you get very unique sample sizes and shapes. So these two uh, data sets on the left, we have mouse E15 embryo and specifically zoomed in on the heart section and on the right, you have mouse brain. We have very different looking um, samples. So looking at the heart, these are hand-drawn um, regions of interest or ROIs that someone painstakingly went through and wanted to find look at these structures um, specifically. And then here on mouse brain, this orange and yellow section um, are two different samples. So the yellow in this are neutrons and the other ones are, or the oranges, neutrophil sections. So, um, but these images come either directly off of the instrument or these ones specifically are from our Spatial Organ Atlas um, website. And they're using very specific software that is either hard to use, takes some time, is in a different language than most of the analysis is done in. So it's a little bit hard to actually do analysis or make a, a uh, publication worthy image. So that's where spatial omics overlay comes into play. We wanted something that was R based, which is where most of our customers are the language that most people are using. We wanted a fast solution and we wanted it to make beautiful figures that could work in any manuscript. So that's where spatial elements overlay comes into play. Both of these images are on the same data set that I showed um, previously, but done in R, are ggplot based, and are very customizable. So uh, here's that heart part, um, and here's the segmented ROIs. So, <laughs> excuse me. Each of these are um, overlaid exactly onto the image, exactly where they're meant to be, and you can customize them to be whatever you want them to be. So an example of this is in that same preprint paper, um, we wanted to highlight 
genes on tissue substructure and actually showcase these. So if we look at this first one, we're looking at tissue substructure, which um, are highlighted or are colored like this. But if we look at EPCAM, which is an epithelial tissue marker, go back over here, look at the pink sections. You can see that the gene expression of EPCAM very it's only shown in the epithelial cells. And we can go through that with all of the other tissue markers. Um, so while you can show this in a box plot or any other plot that you think you, that you can think of, it's much more striking when you can actually put it onto the image itself. So all of this is able to be done using the OME TIFF file that comes straight off of our instrument. So this is our standardized file that comes from the open microscopy group. And in this OME TIFF, it contains two files. It contains a pyramidal TIFF, which is all of the images. Um, it actually has multiple images that are at different resolutions. So if you don't need to be working with the largest resolution and want some faster rendering times, then you can work with a smaller image and it's the same data. And then the XML file um, looks something like this, and it contains all of the information that you need um, for this. So it contains the mask coordinates, it contains the fluorescent image or fluorescent colors and all of that sort of thing. So all of our data comes from this one file, which is super cool. So all of the data is directly from the instrument. There's no guessing on where it, it might be on the image, what this coordinate might be. Um, so it's pretty cool. So we're going to move over into the demo now. Are there any questions before we move to the demo? OK, sounds good. Um, so here we're loading in the overlay package and geomics tools, which is where our data is located. So the only files that you'll need for this package are the only tip off of a geomics instrument. Right now it only works on geomics, but with other parsing functions, it should work with any other only tip um, out there. Then a lab worksheet that um matches the samples in the OME TIFF to the annotation file. This annotation file takes or contains any type of annotation you want. So it can be count data, it can be what type of segment it is, where the tissue came from, all of that. So the first step is just to get your TIFF file. This file um is just a just a file path to your TIFF. Um, this is currently a function to download the mouse brain data from the spatial organ atlas, which is the data I showed beforehand, um, and it caches it. So you only have to download it once. So now we're getting our lab worksheet, and then we're reading in the spatial overlay object. Here it's extracting that XML, and then it's going to be parsing it both for the image data. And then for the coordinate data, and then we'll be generating the coordinates from there. So while that's running, it will say if you have other. Um, a a hey, Maddie. Oh, me tip. Yeah. Okay, sorry to interrupt because um, I was just checking. Mm -hmm. We didn't. Do you have links for where these things are? If people want to kind of follow along. Yeah. Do they want it in the chat? Yeah, if you put it in the chat, then um, I I will get them a, not quick, but onto the website. But then I'll I'll figure out a way to get them quickly to people in the room. Yep. Um. So that first one is the vignette, and then the second one is the package download. Is everybody on Slack at all? All right. So while this is still generating the coordinates, 
if you have data that's not um, geomics data, then these are all of the functions that go into this wrapper. Um, so you can make functions similar to these for your own OME tip file. So now that we have the object, we can look at that object and it's a spatial overlay object. This only works um, on one slide at a time. So here's the name of your slide, how many overlays you have and the names of all of those. Um, for geomix data, we have to know what panel is used and then if any of your data is segmented. So um, there are, I'll show this a little bit later, but there are three different ways to plot your images. And one of them is outline. This means that we are only taking the outline data. Um, but if your data is segmented, you cannot do outline. Um, cannot, yeah. Um, so this is what the object looks like. There's some other accessor functions, getting all of your samples, getting the slide name, um, and getting some other meta metadata shown here. So right now, we're going to start this because it takes a little bit of time. Um, so right now, we're going to plot the overlay data, um, and we're doing it at a low resolution. So this is this will allow a little bit faster rendering times, but if we go back to this real quick, without adding the image, all of the coordinate data is based on this largest resolution. So it takes a little bit, bit of time without the image added um, because it's trying to plot all of the points that are available. So um, let's see. While that's thinking, we can show it over here. So this is what that image looks like. Um, once it plots, and this is again the low resolution um, image, so the edges aren't crisp. But if you do it high res, you plot all of the points, and it um, becomes a crisp image. So yes, we're still waiting on that. Like I said, it does take a little bit of time to run that. Um, but we can see it on the knitted vignette. So the next thing we're going to do is add plotting factors um, because on this one, we're just plotting the sample ID and that's not very informative um, to start with. So here we're reading in the lab worksheet, which just, um, is just a, I get the wrong one. Um, just a data frame of uh, annotations. And then we're going to read in a geomic set object, which has all of our count data. Um, let's see, it has more annotations like slide name and scan name, and then all of our count data here. So from these annotations from the lab worksheet, we're going to add segment type. From the geomic set object, we're going to add the expression of column one, the gene column one. And then just to show that it can, we're adding a vector um, called our ROI label. So plotting factors can come from data frames, matrices, geomic set objects, and vectors right now. Um, and your plotting factor can be either a column name or a row name. Um, and it will automatically find that data. So if we look at the object again, we can now see that these plotting factors have been added. Um, and if we look at them, we can see the segment type has fall ROI, the column one gene expression, and then that um, arbitrary vector that we added. So um, I'm not going to plot this because we're still it's still going to take a while, so I'm going to show it on here. And here you can see that we're plotting by the column one gene expression. Um, and all of these plots are ggplot based, so you can customize them exactly like you would on any other um, ggplot figure. And a scale bar is generated every single time that you plot the image if you want it. There's also um, you can do scale bar equals false and it won't calculate it and won't add it. But 
here we're doing a scale bar that's a uh, uh, thirty percent of the width, and we've colored it to green. So it's fully customizable, just like everything else in the image. But if we go back to here, we're going to be adding the image. So um, we're going to choose resolution six in this data set. There are eight layers. Um, going back to this, so. Actually, it might be easier to see it on this one. Sorry for all of the flipping of slides. So in the OME TIFF, resolution one is the largest resolution. And as you go down, it gets lower in resolution. And each of these images are half the size as the previous resolution. So in our image, um, if we can check the lowest resolution here, and it will be resolution eight. So for the next or for the continual continuation of this workshop we're going to use resolution six and then we're going to add the image onto the object so we take the object the tiff file and then whatever resolution you want this addition of the ome tiff can happen at the very beginning of um making the object so if we scroll up here as it's calculating the coordinates again um, we go up to our read spatial overlay. In this case, we did image equals false just to show the um, what you can do without the image, but you can set this to true and it'll do this same process um, that is that we're doing now. So it's recalculating the coordinates. Every time that you add an image, it's going to recalculate the coordinates because the coordinates start off um, on resolution one, and we need to scale it down to whatever resolution you choose so that it, it continues to match. But once that is done, we can plot another image. This one, we're going to plot by segment type. We're going to put a scale bar in the top center of the image. Um, it takes up 50% of it, and we're going to color it um, a cyan color. Now that that's finished calculating the coordinates, we can look at the image or the object again, and we can see that an image is added. The images themselves are um, magic pointers, but in the show function, we're showing where the image came from. And then you can do any of the magic um, functionality on that pointer, but show image ends up um, showing the image in your browser. And then we can plot this, like I said. Um, this plotting is going to be faster now that it's at a lower resolution because there are fewer points on it. There's that scale bar. So that's the main functionality, but there are a couple of um, addition or things that you can do on top of that. So one thing is to add visualization markers. Um, these are immunofluorescent images, so it's nice to know what markers were used for that. So the easiest way to do that is just add for legend equals true, and it'll add a legend um, on your image where all of the other legends are at. Um, but sometimes it does get a little bit to read like this yellow one. Um, but this is typically for more um, playing around with the data and not really your publication ready data set or your publication figure. And that's where CalPlot comes into play. We're going to make up a, a spatial overlay plot and then we're going to add a fluorescent legend that looks like this. So again, you can't really see the, the white and I apologize for that, but um, it has all of the markers in there colors and then you add the cow plots on top of the other image. So this ends up taking a little bit of time to correctly place the box and know where to put it, know how big to make it, um, but it does look a lot nicer when you're ready for a publication ready figure. Um, many of you probably noticed that this brain um, is upside down 
for what we typically um, are used to. So here we can flip the image um, and it'll be saved into the object. So next time we plot it, we'll have everything flipped over the Y axis. Um, but if you don't want it to be saved, you can also just plot it. Um, so we're going to flip over the X axis on this one. Um, so this data won't be saved, but you can plot it in that way. You can also crop the image. So in these images, there's a lot of black space around the tissue um, that takes up a lot of space. So here we can crop to the tissue. It'll automatically find where the tissue is and put a buffer around it. So here we're plotting that same cropped image um, by ROI label, which is the arbitrary vector that we put on the data. And it's colored by, um, it's a Veritas color scheme. And then we can also crop by sample type or samples. Um, so in this case, we're going to choose all of the full ROIs um, in our data set. And we're going to crop it to include only the samples that we want. So only these full ROI samples. And so we're going to crop by that. And the tissue goes over to where the, let's see if I can get this in one view. Tissue goes over um, to only show the full ROIs. But we can also crop where we want any sample in this field of view. It doesn't matter if it's the sample that you picked or not. And we can do that as well and then show that. So in this case, once it plots, we now have not only the full ROIs, but the segmented ones as well. And the last um, bit that we have here is you can recolor the image. Um, here, we have to add the four channel image again, and then, um, can I do that? Okay. Um, this might take a little bit of time um, because we're adding the image again, but what, here, we can go back to this. But once we add the four channel image, um, this is the fluorescence data that comes out of it. Um, and you can see the color code. This color code is what determines what color the image, um, color the image is. So here we're gonna change our Fitzy die, which is this one right here. We're gonna change this hex code to another arbitrary hex code. And then we're gonna change Alexa 646, which is this one right here. Um, we're going to change this color code to magenta. And then you can change the coloring intensity as well. And that'll change here. So after those changes, you can see that they've been, they've been done. And the listed color has also been updated with that. So then we recolor the image. And this is the image that you get. But the it, the color of the image should be the same color that comes off of the Geomix machine. Um, if you've played around with the coloring on there, it should be the same. This is just um, just in case it's not the right color that you that you want. So, um, and so that's the that's the package um, right now. Um, Currently, it's released on an internal website called GeoScript Hub, um, and there's a download tarball there and a vignette, which are the links that I put in the chat. Um, and we're hoping to get this released on Bioconductor in the fall. But in a couple of future releases, we're hoping to add graphing on top of images. So using those XY coordinates, being able to add graphs on top of that, um, we're going to make sure that this is compatible with our new Cosmics machine that's coming out this fall, which is um, at single cell resolution. So this package should work all the way down to single cell resolution. We want to be able to extract data um, to put into machine learning applications 
And after yesterday's spatial feature experiment, um, we think it might be nice to have a coercion of our um, our object into that um, for other people to use. Okay, do we have any questions from people in the room? Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, have you tried overlaying the segmentation results onto the image, for example, for the Cosmix platform that you're going to release? Yeah, we haven't yet. Um, all of the segmentation, this essentially is the segmentation results um, for our data, at least on genomics. So we haven't gotten to um, the cosmics data yet. Yeah, because with the cell segmentation, there are a lot, there are going to be a lot of polygons. It's, so it's going to be very slow. So it could be very different. <laughs> yeah. Um, the cosmics data will most likely use the. Um, I, I don't actually have a good picture of this, the outline function. Um, and so it just does the outline points. But uh, I at that point, it might be nice to optimize it and maybe go to like an SF package or something along those lines um, to try and speed up times. Anybody else here? I haven't seen anything online, but we were able to get your links up. They're now on the website, uh, the Bio, BioC 2022 website for people to look at. Um, we have some extra time. I don't know if you had any live coding last minute stuff you wanted to do. I don't think so. I think I <laughs> live coding. Ah! <laughs> Unless anyone wanted to see um, a specific thing off of this data. Um. Uh, does she, does the... Hi, I was going to ask, does the uh, package do any like quantitative analysis where you're comparing expression levels? It doesn't. Um, it just puts that um, that data on an image for you. Okay, great. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, Maddie, maybe if you can pull up Geomix workflows so that they can actually see that quantitative part. It's in a separate, so oh, these yeah. folks are in a separate package, and Maddie's package is supposed to build on top of that quantitative analysis. So you do your quantitative analysis. Um, these packages have been released for a while, and then you move on to Maddie's package to to make your publication ready figures. Yep, that is true. So this is the um, Geomix workflows that I was uh, that I showed at the beginning, or at least a screenshot of it. This is a step by step walkthrough from uh, beginning to end, and so it goes through QC um, and all of the QC types that we do normalization, and then let's say that you want to go through your differential expression genes and you pick out the, the gene that you want to show. So maybe in this case, you want to show off CLIC5 and you can show it between the two, um, two in this case, tubules versus glomeruli and kidney um, and show the expression over the top of your image. Okay, we did get a few okay, questions a few on the chat. On the chat. All right, in the background. Um, so one asked, is this workshop on orchestra, which I believe is no, correct? Um, I don't think so. I didn't add anything to it, so no. But um, the workshop will be the same as the links that I put in the chat. Okay. Yeah, so they'll just have to run it on their own. So I guess that leads to this doesn't need any, everybody can run this on their laptop. They don't need anything special or fancy or large uh, memory. Yeah, it will depend on what image resolution you want to use. Um, 
and what your instrument or your machine can handle. Um, I have been running on a server and can't do bias resolution, um, but maybe your instrument or your machine will end up being at a lower resolution. Okay. And then uh, there's another question on, and I'll read it out so everybody here can see it, is but from Dana King. Apologies if this is a naive, naive question. Can you explain the magic pointer in relation to loading, viewing the image? Yeah, so the magic pointer is a, um, it's a package called magic that's um, spelled like magic with a K or a CK at the end. And so if we, go into oops, view brain and look at the image. Um, so it's, I don't know the back end of their package, but this is just an image pointer to, um, I believe your image file. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't take up as much memory as, uh, actually reading in your image. Um, and Ryan said in the chat that, yeah, it's the image magic bindings for R. So. Okay. Yeah. Right now, if you point, or like if you call the image, the pointer, it'll just pull up the image. There are no last there questions. No last questions. Okay, everyone join me again and thank everyone you, Maddie.